Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of Bobcast with you, as always, is B.O.B. Live in the lounge, staring at the Ouija board. You know, I was thinking about this podcast for better part of two weeks. I was reflecting on it. You know, I turned 41 not too long ago, and it's like, you know, it's not what I expected because within the course of like about two months, I have now interviewed two members of the Monster Squad. Looking back in the year, what, 1988, when I first saw it, like, you know, I couldn't imagine saying to my future self, one day you meet the guy who played Rudy in one of your all-time favorite films. I wouldn't believe this film if it wasn't for the actors portraying the roles. And like, there's so many different things about tonight's guest that I like. And like, I guess the one thing that I never really put together was that like, there was no cool guy in school that also stood up for kids like bullies and shit like that. You know what I mean? Like I always look for them at my school. I was like, Where, where's this guy going to be? You know what I mean? Where's the dude rolling up on the bike, saving the day. <laughs> and it just never happens. So you know what? Like I grew up to be that guy and I'm still uh, like a social justice warrior. I will stop people and be like, no, you were wrong. And I guess it has a lot to do with like pop culture back in the day. So with that being said, I am super stoked to introduce tonight's guest, Mr. Ryan Lambert. How are you, sir? I'm very well, thank you very much. How are you? Like I said, you know, the midlife crisis isn't as, you know, it's not bad, you know what I mean? Like I'm here doing this with you and it just makes so much more sense. <laughs> well, your, 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 you know, your midlife crisis is like in its early stages. <laughs> tell me, tell I'm, me I'm about to turn 50. It. I'm about to turn 50 in like three weeks or something like that, so. Uh, no crisis though. I'm, I'm okay with it, but, uh, it is a little strange to think like, you're, like you think about it your whole life, like 50, never going to make it to that. It's weird, right? Cause here I am <laughs> it, it, when you process it. I, I mean, like I process it through movies, really. I mean, like, I guess I had my own type of WandaVision before it was even a thing, you know, <laughs> I, um, like I would look at like people like in like, you know, be like, well, how old is he, that guy, man? He's in his forties. Well, that's what that's gonna look like or he's in his fifties. But I mean, like, I guess, you know, age is really a, a state of mind in the, in the scheme of things if you're still doing what you love, you know? Oh, for sure. It doesn't really affect my creativity or anything. If, any, if anything, it's stronger than it's ever been. Um, my mother has this same thing. Like uh, she's always comparing things. Like when I was thirty-five, that you know, that's how old you are now. When I was doing this, and you know, like oh, you're gonna be fifty. I when I was fifty, you were doing this thing. You're like okay. Just yeah, what's stop. up with that generation? Why they? My mom does that too. She's like, well, when I was your age, I was well on my way through my career, and I'm like, mom, right. I'm just here to eat dinner. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to talk about it. It didn't go the way you planned. You know what I mean? Like, can I just eat my macaroni and cheese in peace? Thanks. Yeah. Is there any way that we can have just a semblance of peace without having to like always cross reference? It happens a lot too. I mean, you grew up, uh, you're just a little bit older than me, but I mean, like you grew up in the same, you know, uh, great time, I guess. Uh, I, some people may not call it a great time because you could get canceled. But I mean, the eighties was such a wild, you know, like adventure. And like, I mean, Looking back, I guess I always thought to myself, like, wow, what was it like for the actors to read that script for the first time? Like, what was it like when you read the sides for the character Rudy? Well, <clears throat> I, the thing is, like, you know, when I was a kid, you know, there was an audition, like, maybe every other day. You know, there was always something. Uh, or, like, I was being called in for something. And uh, I if I recall, Monster Squad was just kind of like another audition. It was, you know, I, uh, you know, we didn't, have, obviously we didn't have the internet. So like they couldn't send me the sides electronically. Uh, I, I think I went and got them from my agent uh, or, you know, my mom got them or they sent them to a house. I can't remember, but uh, I remember the, the one thing I do remember about it was uh, the description of the character and I just said, oh, yeah, I got this. Like, I'm going to get it. I know I'm going to get it. I, I just know it. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look exactly like what they want because I kind of already do. My hair's already, like, spiked up or whatever. I'm wearing a leather jacket right now. I'm going to bring the Ray-Bans. And, uh, and I, I, you know, I got this. And, and, you know, when I went in, 
I'm reading for uh, Penny Perry, it's cast director, and she sent me on to Fred and Shane, and uh, Fred Decker, Shane Black. And uh, I remember I walked in and uh, I sat down and they asked a few questions and they said, are you ready You know, to do the scene? It was the first scene of, it was Rudy's first scene in the film. And uh, I said, that Shane Black had a, <clears throat> had a pack of marbles in his pocket. And I said, uh, hey dude, can I, can I bum one of those? And he, and they kind of looked at each other like, uh, well, I guess we wrote it into the script that he smokes. So we'll just give him one like as a prop. And uh, of course I asked for a lighter and I lit up in the office and we did the scene and that was pretty much it. I mean, uh, <clears throat> I remember leaving and uh, I, I had just started uh, high school. I, I was like in my first week of high school and I was sitting in a, a science class and I hated it. And I was like, I, I wish I could get out of here. I can't stand this anymore. And, uh, and, my, and then I got a call to the principal's office. And I was like, oh, fuck, what did I do now? Like, what the hell did I do now? I, what did I do? Like, I first week of high school, I already like fucked this up. And I went to the uh, office and my mom was standing there and she said, hi, Rudy. And I was oh. like, oh, I got the thing, I got the thing. And she's like, yeah, <laughs> I ha I'm actually here to pick you up. We have to go to wardrobe right now. Dude. And, and I never, ever went back to that school, that was it. I was done with that that type of high, big, big, huge high school. I wound up going to like a little private school in Hollywood, but uh, yeah, you know, every you know every audition, you just kind of like you do it and then you leave and you and you don't think about it ever again. That's always my advice. Like don't 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 harp on it. Don't like oh, I wish I could get that part. Just you know, just do it. Do your best and get out of there. And then throw the sides in the trash, and and if you get it, you get it. If you don't, move on. I so happen to get that one. <laughs> couple things. Uh, that that story right there, uh, that origin story of how you got the role. I mean, like it'll go down in history as probably one of the best stories told on the Bobcast because it fulfilled <laughs> literally all like the dopamine parts of my brain that needed to be filled. <laughs> <laughs> With, uh, you know, I mean, getting called, I used to get called to the principal's office all the time, Robert Cahill, like, what did I do? You know what I mean? Like, but to right. that role, and, and it also ties in, you know, all these other questions that I had, which I was going to wait until later, but I'll bring them up now. Case in point, uh, so you're entering ninth grade, and you say that you already were smoking cigarettes. When did you pick up smoking? Oh, uh, <clears throat> uh, if my mother's listening, close your ears. Um, we, I was one of the kids that like, you know, like I, I like to, uh, see what things, what's, what's happening with things. Like, what is this thing? You know, I've been watching films since I was, you know, just a wee little toddler or whatever. And, you know, I always saw, I like to watch the old, uh, like noir films. Mm -hmm. I remember watching a lot of those when I was a kid, Double Indemnity, Touch of Evil. And like, you know, and, and of course, like all the, you know, Scorsese gangster shit and and uh you know I had very liberal I have very liberal parents and I was sort of allowed to watch whatever I wanted to and I always saw like I've always wanted to be a performer whether it was a musician or actor or what have you but uh I always saw uh the cool guys smoking you know and and then I I read a biography when I was young on James Dean and there was this wonderful picture of him with his feet up on like a like a dining room table, and he's got a book in his hand, and he's got he's smoking. His hair's like totally fucked up, and he's and there's a pack of Winston lights on the on the table, and I was like, yeah, I need to I need to try that. <laughs> so let's say fourteen. Nice. Uh, I was 15. Uh, it was a combination of Kurt Cobain and you. So um, there's yeah. that. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, I just remember being like a kid being like, wow, that looks really cool, man. You know, and like, it's funny because, you know, I just quit two years ago and I've never even posted on social media about quitting because I really do believe that that's the way I quit by not talking about it and like not, you know, uh, sure. it's a ha really hard thing to do. Um, but yeah, like throughout the years, I was always like, 
God damn it, Rudy. Why did you do this shit to me? Because you know I, mean? <laughs> I, I do miss it. And like, look, I mean, it is what it is. I'm not saying that later down in life, you know what I mean? With all these, you know, planned pandemics and apocalypses coming our way, the, you know, right. the, the grocery store is not too far away. But I mean, <laughs> just the whole like process though, like of you becoming Rudy and like you saying that, you know, the character was kind of like who you were at that time. And now you're telling me uh, you were into James Dean. Um, I just watched the disaster artist the other night when they, when they drive out there to oh, uh, the crash yeah. site, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I've actually been there myself. Mm -hmm. I actually, um, I did a film in, uh, in Indianapolis, uh, not long after the monster squad. And, um, James Dean was, uh, born in, uh, Fairmount, Indiana. And, uh, I had a couple days off from shooting and I, I kind of got friendly with one of the like extras that were in, that was in that film. We kind of became friends and, uh, he had, a, you know, he, he drove, uh, he drove me out there to see his little hometown. We wound up going to this like tiny little museum. I saw like his, uh, old Indian bike and uh and then I asked the lady I said where where is he buried and they said she said well it's uh it's this particular cemetery it's a little bit out uh, on the outskirts of town and uh it's unmarked because people were stealing the the gravestone sorry I've got a fire truck going by uh, <laughs> uh I live in the big bad city sorry uh uh, and, and I said, is there any way, you know, I'm an actor, I'm doing a film in Indianapolis. I'm not just some whack job out here, like, you know, following, following Jimmy, like, this is kind of like an important thing for, she said, sure, I'll, I'll show you where it is. And she did. And she goes, you know, she pointed and said, he's buried right there. And I just laid down and smoked a cigarette and I fell asleep on his grave. That's cool. And like, I don't know, I, I don't, I'm not necessarily one to believe in like, you know, spirits and spirituality and all that stuff. But there was a sense that I was kind of getting some vibes, you know? Like, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, I'm, a, I'm into spirits and stuff like that. I, I had a similar experience. Um, I was playing at this place called the Mercury Lounge um, when Heath Ledger passed away. And uh, it was uh, like a couple blocks up, you know what I mean? It was just devastating. Another dude who like wore the the Wayfair, the you know the glasses it looked really cool, you know. It just sucked. Yeah. And, um, just these actors, though. I mean, they all go back to. Where's the Mercury Lounge? It sounds familiar to me. I can't Where's remember. That? I mean, this is like 2005. Um, I used to. I live in Philadelphia, but I used to go up there in New York quite a bit to play. Uh, you know, uh, Arlene's groceries. Uh, you know, pianos, stuff like that. Oh, pianos. I've played pianos. Yeah, right, with that high stage. Yeah, oh my God. It's kind of like oh, a right. terrible place. A I don't know why thing. it was so popular. I, 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 when we walked in, I was like, this is I, pianos? Like, yeah, I was the same that, thing. I was like, what, the bar's over here? and like The bar's in front, and room? then the thing's in the back. Yeah, <laughs> like, what the fuck? So you live in Los Angeles right now, right? I do. I'm back in Los Angeles. I've been back for about six years now. And uh, I was in San Francisco for about 15 years. Very cool. Two places I love. I used to live in uh, like Silver Lake, you know, um, there was this place that I used to go to and I loved it so much. It, it was called uh, Spaceland on uh, Spaceland. Yep. I played there many times. I played at Spaceland many times. It's it, They changed the name. I forgot is what it, it is gone? now. It's now it's gone. Yeah. Ugh. Well, because of the pandemic, it's gone. It, you know, they changed. It, it used to be called like Dreams something. Then they changed it to Spaceland, and then they changed it to something else. And it was had a new owner. It wasn't as cool. In the nineties, it was awesome because like they had the smoking lounge and they had yeah. pool tables back there. Yeah, the yeah that was that was not that, that compared to pianos was like wait, <laughs> like I know, right? I, I, and that's just the thing too is like when we moved out to Los Angeles, I really you know I, I thought it was easy to play these places. I just answered a bunch of bunch of ads on Craigslist and people were like, "Where are you playing?" I'm like, "I'm playing on the Sunset Strip," and this was like our second month there. It wasn't hard. We played this place. It was so far off the map. Um, the Mint. The mint, yep. like oh, on Pico, yeah, on Pico, all mostly a jazz. It's mostly a jazz club, but yeah. Ben Harper watched our set from the bar, and like, we yeah, were just sitting there, like you know, punk kids from Philly, like you know, 
but yeah, I look back um, fondly, you know, and it's really, it sucks what's going on now. I mean, like in Los Angeles, you like with all the restrictions that you guys have to go, go through, you know? It's interesting because um, yeah, a lot of places are closing, but a lot of places are being um, saved by, by, by locals, you know? And, and, and the thing is like San Francisco is so tiny and such a small community really. Um, and like the community of like bands that I was playing in, I see stuff all the time and they post, you know, this place closed, that place closed. It's, oh, I'm so sad this place closed. And I'm like, man, LA is not really doing that. Like they're not open now, but they're not going to go anywhere. They'll be there. Yeah, right. They'll come back. Very interesting. I, I played the um, San Francisco. I love because I'm, I'm a big fan of sushi and like, we were only there for, you know, like a night or two and like, I can't remember where I was, but God, it tasted so good. And everyone was really friendly. And uh, I also enjoyed Oakland. Oakland reminded me a lot of Philadelphia by the sea in a way, you know what I mean? Like, and- um, Yeah, it's true, it's true. Um, in Yosemite, do you, do you drive out there to uh, Yosemite? You know what? I've never been to Yosemite. <laughs> oh, definitely check it out. It's really cool. I, yeah, I know. I, I'd like to do a day trip or something or like, you know, is there a hotel nearby? I'm not so much like a nature-y, Mm -hmm. I, I'm just a city kid, you know, I've always been a city kid. Um, I like things to be close by and uh, I don't really like being out in the middle of nowhere or anything, but like, you know, a day, a day thing is cool. They think cool. Yeah. There's an old drinking bar out there. I could set you up with. If I told them that you were coming, they would, they would throw a Jubilee. They would welcome you with the, <laughs> it's the oldest yeah. drinking bar in the state of California. It's called the Iron. Oh, Coast I'm going. Oh, no, dude, hook it up. Let's has do the it. Oldest liquor come out here. Like, take, just, you just take me there. Just no, come out here. I, I will. I will. I haven't been there uh, in like eight years, but the, it literally was my favorite place to play music live. Um, oh, rad. Speaking of music, um, like I was checking out some of the stuff today on YouTube, uh, Elephone and stuff like that. Like, w did you always have that in your life? Was it always like this mixture of like acting and music back and forth? Uh, well, it started with music because I was, a uh, you know, like I sang in like, you know, the earliest things I did were maybe like, you know, school plays and musicals and things like that. You know, in even elementary school, uh, I was in like the chorus and I always had the solo, you know, song. And then uh, I got involved in a, um, a musical comedy troupe outside of school called Bill Edwards on Stage Kids. I mean, it was like full-blown like sequent you know vests with the top hat and you know hello my baby you know you know it was very like yankee doodle dandy and Pretty george cool. and conan stuff and and we did a lot of you know we did a, we we did medleys of uh uh tunes from sh you know show tunes and things like that and uh, you know with, there is nothing like a dame nothing in the world you know <laughs> we're doing like south pacific and uh yeah, so my love, of me, and, and the thing is my, um, my father is a, uh, he's an aficionado of like 50s, 60s and 70s rock, pop and soul. Like he'll tell you who played tambourine on a Turtles record, you know, like, he, he, he knows everything. So my childhood growing up was, and, and you have to remember like this was the 70s, like we're, you know, and we moved from Cleveland to Los Angeles when I was three. So um, my father and my mother, you know, they've both been listening to Beatles, Elvis, just anything from the fifties, uh, all the Motown stuff, you know. Uh, so records were spinning in my house like 24 seven. Um, and my dad would like school me on it. That's know? cool. It, it wasn't just like it was on. It was like, okay, listen to this track right here. Listen to this part right here listen to this thing, listen to what the guitar does right here. He really like kind of took me through, took me on the journey of the whole thing. In fact, you know, because the seventies, uh, you know, I was Mr. Star Wars and like, I, I just wanted to play with my Star Wars toys and listen to the Star Wars soundtrack and like Saturday Night Fever and Grease and all that. And he would come in my, I had my own record player in my room and he would come in and say, all right, all right, enough is enough. Like he'd take off the Grease record and he would put on Dark Side of the Moon. Wow. So put he headphones on. Like, today's father like taking away his cell phone from a kid and be like- Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. like that. He would put the headphones on me and he would turn out the lights and I would have yeah. to lay in bed and listen to like Dark Side of the Moon going. 
oh my god, what the hell is this? It, but it, like the, it, the great, it, like, it found its way great. into my heart, mm -hmm. and uh, I started to like you know learn to play and and all that stuff, and 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 then I I wanted to be a performer, and I was do I was already doing the musical comedy stuff. So I was really comfortable being on stage, and there was like some sort. Of, we did scenes sometimes from from films. We did some of the dialogue from from theater, and uh, I just fell in love with the whole thing. And so I told my mom, I said, I want to do this for real. Like I want to do it professionally. I was ten years old, and she took me to see E.T. And I looked at Henry Thomas on the screen after my seventh viewing in the theaters, <laughs> and I said, uh, Yeah, that's I want to do that. I want to do that too. I want to sing and I want to act. I want to do both. And she said, oh, okay, let's figure out how we do this. And she found an audition for me and she, she took me to uh, this crazy church on Highland and Franklin. If you know Hollywood, you know yeah. that church well. I do know that church. Um, and uh, it was a cattle call for a television show. And I went back like, I think three times. Uh, they kept calling me back in for various things. And then I got it. I got the, I got the very first audition I ever went on, which was uh, Kids Incorporated. Which is totally cool. I was checking out some stuff today on the internet of that. And it, it just, such a great time capsule. Um, one of the oh, things yeah. that you made right there, which uh, makes me happy to know is that you're a Star Wars fan. So, I mean, like, yet we're, we're, I'm having my midlife crisis. You're about to turn 50, but yet we have the Mandalorian. You know what I mean? Like, things are yeah. okay over here. My son's it's five. It's so interesting. Yeah, it, it's such yeah. a, like, uh, watching the Mandalorian to me is like, I, I, I want to talk to someone who is, like, kind of like a newbie, mm -hmm. like a like a, a kid, like a little kid watching that. And I'm like, you have no idea what you're watching. Like, <laughs> you don't know what this is doing to me. Like, it, this is yeah. killing. I worked at, when I lived in San Francisco, I worked at a private school. And uh, this kid, this like, I think he was like in first or second grade. He was wearing a Star Wars shirt, like from The Gap or something like that. And, and, and uh, he just walked by my desk at one point and I said, hey, whatever his name was. Hey, Jimmy, that cool shirt, man. And he looks at me, comes up to my desk, looks at me, stares in my face and he goes, Mr. Ryan, you know Star Wars? <laughs> and I said, come a little closer while I strangle you. <laughs> like, let, let, for, sit down and let me tell you, let yeah. me tell you a little story. I'm, I am Star Wars. Like I'm an OG Star, like I was at, I was at Grauman's Chinese Theater opening day when you see that like aerial shot of, of of chinese theater and it says star wars on the marquee and there's thousands and thousands of people standing around and darth vader and c3po and r2d2 are putting their footprints in the cement i'm there i was there my dad took me i'm on i'm on his shoulder i can't see i can't find myself in the crowd in the picture but like i know i'm there and uh so you know, when people talk about Star Wars, like, oh, you're so into Star Wars. I'm like, it's not that I'm like so into it. It's just that it's just a major part of my life of, of a period of time where like I was the first one to send away for the action figures because they weren't in stores yet. You had to like box top it. And like, it was crazy. It was, a, it was insane. It, that movie, like, no, it, no, nothing had ever been made like that. Nothing had ever been seen like that before. No, which it's so crazy too, because looking back, I mean, like I'm reintroducing it to my son who's five and like we're watching the older films and he doesn't know the difference between, you know, the late seventies and, you know, 20, he doesn't know yet, you know what I mean? Like the differences and stuff, but like he loves the fact that there's so much Star Wars, but the Mandalorian though, for, for me and my son though, is just, I'll always look back like as an old man being like, wow, that was the show that we really bonded together, you know? Cause it's like, Oh. At the heart of it, it really is just, you know, a father and his son trying to make their way across the universe. And it's like, they took Star Wars and just made it such a great, like, heartfelt story, you know? Like, that last episode, I watched it that, fr you know, the Friday night that it came out. And I just remember, like, it was late and I just called all the people I knew to chat about it. And, like, yeah. I woke up early the next morning to cut a podcast because I was just like, I can't believe they did it people who are listening to this if you don't know whatever you know what I mean spoilers but I mean the fact that they did do that and there's the potential to continue that storyline because 
we could talk. If forever. they haven't seen it by now, it's not a spoiler anymore. Exactly. <laughs> it's too late. Like or you, like you, spoiled it, on the internet or something like that. But who, who, Star Wars yeah, is who, just amazing that it continues that way, you know. And also too, I mean, we also have to give you know credence to the Monster Squad, really too, because I mean, this film comes out. You know, it, it's it's in you know August, late summer. You know what I mean? And people are like, "What's this?" And like they don't see it right away and they wait. And then all these years later, you know, I just did the podcast with Andre. We talked about Wolfman's got nards, the legacy of it and how, you know, people continue to talk about it. Like I got hit up by so many people. I'm going to get hit up again. now that I'm collecting the squad, but I got so many nice letters from people who I know throughout the years who I wouldn't necessarily know them to be as a monster squad fan, you know, like, and, it really means a lot to people. As I mentioned before in that one podcast, you know, there's a lot of themes in that film that, you know, I don't know if Shane, like, he must have been really in tune towards like, you know, like what that culture was like, the dialogue, the way that they interact. But I mean, like, you know, the whole thing with like, don't judge a book by the cover, you know, the reveal of, you know, um, scary German guy is somebody who's, you know, an ally, not somebody to be feared. It, it taught me a lot, you know what I mean? And like, kind of like the same way Star Wars does, you know what I mean? With like, you know, the, the force and like trying to be a good person, don't go to the dark side, don't be a Sith, even though it's <laughs> fun and there's more songs written, written about the dark side. I was just having a discussion with my friend. There's way too many songs about the devil and none about God really. You know? <laughs> and it's just odd, but I mean, the Monster Squad, I mean, like I, I've i seen it so many times and I, there, I have so many different questions as it relates to it, but I mean, it's super cool that you knew who he was before you even got the role. Day one, what's your first scene? Uh, it was the scene. It was the first scene. It was hit. It was Rudy's first scene. We we shot. Yeah, we went. Did you guys shoot we linear, or was it out of order, or you just? It, well, the, uh, yeah, the whole shoot was out of order, but that was actually mm -hmm. my first scene. Uh, they just did all the school stuff first, and and got that stuff out of the way. Um, but I remember. Um, I mean, you're, you're saying like, I, I, I did know who the character was. I mean, I did know the essence of what, of what Rudy was like sort of on the surface. Uh, and that's kind of how I got the part. But, um, when I went in for wardrobe, they try, you know, I was trying on like various leather jackets and the wardrobe lady was like, you know, try this one on, do this one, you know, what, what let, and they were taking pictures to see if, if, you know, which one worked the best. And she put one on me and said, uh, oh, I like this one. This one's good. Let's, let's take some pictures for, for, uh, for Fred. And I said, you know what? I don't, I don't know about this one. Like, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like me. It doesn't feel like me. And she looked me in the eye and she said, Ryan, you're not playing you. And I said, oh my God. Like, it just clicked in my brain. I'm like, I'm not playing me. This isn't me. Like, maybe I have some of the same characteristics, but like, <clears throat> for the most part, I don't act this way. I don't do these things. I don't, you know, I'm just kind of a normal kid. Um, yeah, maybe I like have my hair spiked up and I listen to rock and roll and la 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 la. But like, this is a different person. Also, like all the, you know, rumors in the script about his character. Uh, you know, at one point, like Phoebe says, I heard he killed his dad. Like, we don't know who this guy really is. So I had to like sort of create a little backstory for him. And I was like, is he, is it really that simple where like he has a crappy, like, childhood you know his father was ah, mean to him ah, ah, ah. like you know is this bender from breakfast club you know like does he really have like a shitty home life or is he just sort of lonely and like a misunderstood you know obviously he's misunderstood because no one really knows who he is but uh uh for the most part you know take off the leather jacket take the smoke out of his mouth take the, the glasses off and, and and put his hair down and and he's just wearing like jeans and a t-shirt. Like, who is this guy? Like, he's just a kid that maybe, maybe in junior high, he's being bullied. And so he kind of turns around and helps younger kids, you know, that are being bullied. I, I kind of thought about that a lot 
when we were shooting. I was like, why is he, why is this guy who's in junior high, like hanging out with these little kids? Also, why does he know more about monsters than they do? <laughs> they're a monster club, you know? Yeah. They, start, they have a clubhouse with, mon- they're asking this character, they're asking Rudy questions about monsters and, and he, knows, he knows every answer and they don't. So very interesting. What, yeah, never... what, how did he? Why is why does he want to hang out with these kids? He must not have much, many friends, and he wants to be a part of something. So you have to like take that stuff into account when you're watching it, and also when we were shooting it, because who knows what this who this kid was? It's still kind of a mystery. It really is we a never, mystery. You don't really know we much. Never about see him. his parents. We never see his home life. We never know. It's all like it's still a thing. But now he's a part of something. That's important. He's the wild card. You know yeah, what I mean? For, for sure. An episode of uh, Always Sunny in Philadelphia where Charlie was like, he's, I'm the wild card. I always thought that Rudy... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's always these parts too, like in these films too, where there's like this older, wiser kid who's h- hanging out with the, the younger kids. And I've really, I've never really talked about it. It happens a lot in different films. Um, so you make this backstory up and like, you know, you, you progress through... It's interesting, too, how you said, like, I am not this person. You know what I mean? I was just listening to uh, Mark Maron, and he was interviewing uh, Jake Gyllenhaal, and, like, people come up to him all the time and say, so you're really like the guy from Nightcrawler? Do you get that a lot? Do people come up to you, and they they want to, like, basically, uh, you know, shoot bows and arrows and smoke cigarettes with you and stuff like that? Or Yeah, I get a lot of that at conventions. They can can we go outside and have smoke? And I'm like, Sure. 25 oh bucks God, how much, so how much does it cost for the smoke <laughs> to have a yeah, they always want to have they always want to have a cigarette with me yeah uh yeah i mean you know i've seen like people come up to me like cosplaying rudy and they're like can we get a picture oh can you put the glasses on can you put the jacket on i'm like i don't have any of that with me <laughs> like i'm, <laughs> I'm not you, like underneath your table and they're like hey, yeah Brian, real quick i'm change. an actor like i'm a fucking actor and like I, you know they they put the clothes on me. I don't have like an old fifties leather jacket I wear every day. And and I said, oh wait, hold on, maybe I do have the Ray Bans on me. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because it's like you know, I mean, that separation. It's and it, it also plays into pop culture too because people who are super fans of pop culture tend to go you know much deeper than most. You know, what I mean, case in point, Star Wars. I mean, I I had some friends who just didn't come out for a few weeks after. Um, you know, um, the the Last Jedi. They just, they were so devastated. They, it was like they had lost like a family member. So it means a lot to people. And it's crazy because I was talking about- Why, why is, is that? that? Last, Last Jedi was badass. <laughs> you know, a lot of people, you know, I really think that the color scheme in it is, is, is amazing. If you look at it from a, a technical point, how he uses like, you know, the reds and stuff like that. I, I think it, they wanted Luke to come back looking, you know, super you know smart and you know what i mean not the the grizzled version that we got but that would have been boring though if he was just you know like let's go here's the, th- here's the thing about that that whole thing like i i don't ever get pissed off at like things that i am in love with and then uh i never think like they're not doing the thing i want them to do here here's the thing it's like when they're when they're creating these stories where they're continuing the Skywalker saga. There's a lot of people working on that stuff and not, I mean, it's not just one guy in his room writing the screenplay, you know, like there's a lot of factors involved there. And one of the factors that they're not going to consider is uh, Steven's opinion in his basement in Iowa. You know, these people are artists and they're gonna make their art. And whether it's, you know, you're you're in your room painting a picture or you're writing the next Star Wars film, it's still art. And whether you like it or not, you can have an opinion when it's done, but they're not listening to you. Oh, oh, Oh my God, Steven in his basement in Iowa wants us to do this. This is how he wants the story to go. Well, guess what? Crazy, right? You don't get to choose that. Hey, you want the story to be the way you want it to be? Come to Hollywood and see if you can like muscle your way in. You know what I mean? I totally know what you mean. And uh, 
So I'm stop just, yet. I hate these people that like, eh, 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 well, they, they get feel angry, like this. Right? I didn't like that it happened like this. It's like, great. That's not how they wanted the story to go. Well, crazy thing too is like, I mean, like the guy, you know, in the basement in Iowa, you know, like uh, there was a lot of people in, in basements writing in for years about the Zack Snyder cut. You know, I'm a huge like comic book guy and like, I still can't believe that this thing's coming out like in, in a week or two. And it's like in chapters now, I guess they're going for a Quentin Tarantino cut vibe, but it's like, does that mean that now we will have a continuation of these, you know, petitions by fans to be like, rewrite that, that trilogy series. We don't want, you know, Luke Skywalker like that. We want baby Grogu to change the timeline at the last Jedi temple. You know I mean? Like so much crazy stuff on the internet, man. It's wild. I, I think our generation will I, never I would grow tell up. you that these people that are, especially the Mandalorian, um, I can't remember his name off the top of my head now. Um, he's like kind of like second in command, basically, for Absolutely. Mandalorian. Yeah. Um, that, that person knows everything. About, about the Star Wars. Wars. Yeah, I, I agree 100% yeah. on that. Yeah. He, he, he literally is. That, that's why he's there. <laughs> he's like, a good director, too. I, I really like the ones that he did. He's a great um, director. He's amazing. Yeah. But, like, he knows. And he's going to tell Favreau, like, no, that's not how it would happen. So, like, you... So, think about it. Like, the person that you... Not you, you, but, like, the royal you, like, are a Star Wars fan, like, and wanting things to go how it should be and, like, making sure it's, like, following the thing. That's that guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He did the thing that you wish you did. Like, yeah, know. He, you know, <laughs> yeah, he yeah. got in there. They don't want it. They don't want to. I mean, like, that's the thing about Mandalorian, though. Mandalorian doesn't have much backlash. I mean, I guess with Cara Dune's character recently, you know what I mean? That was, a, you know, a whole thing in itself. But I mean. Oh, well, that's not story. That's. Yeah, like, it's not story. But they, I can't stand how, like, it, they, people try to make it the story. It's like, it's just entertainment. It's pop culture. Um, you know, I watch The Mandalorian and I go, fuck, that was amazing. And then I watch something else. Yeah. yeah or I go to cool. bed or I read a book, you know, like I don't go on the internet and go, I know. And it's crazy how much people spend time on that. But it's like also, too, it's like we should just be happy that we're still receiving these things. Especially, it's, it's still even crazy to me that there's like, you know, films being made during this pandemic you know what i mean you can't go to the store, but they're still in zone a and zone b out there like filming and you know it's amazing really that the pop culture machine can't stop even with a mysterious respiratory illness i gotta i have an audition this week and uh i can't i had to sign an nda so i can't talk about it and i don't actually know what it is that's great. Like, they're not telling me, I'm just reading some dialogue and I don't recognize the character names, but they're saying, like, this is like a big thing and we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, well, they changed like it. My, my, my manager was like, I don't know, really, I don't really know what this is, but they're making a sign an NDA. So it must be something big. And I'm like, please be the Mandalorian. Please be the Mandalorian. Please oh be the Mandalorian. <laughs> Can we start a petition for you to get on the Mandalorian? I think we could. Oh my you. God, go for it. So all the, you know, some of those fan groups, they could totally like, uh, you know, get you in there. So many great scenes. I mean, like the one that I'm, I just, I can't get enough of is, uh, I really like Mayfield and like, uh, I love Bill Burr and like the fact that he's in Star Wars just cracks me up because he can't stand Star Wars, you know? Like, oh, it blow Yeah. <laughs> And people say that online too. They're like, he doesn't even like Star Wars. Like, he's an actor doing a job. He doesn't give. Mm -hmm. it's like, they wanted him, and he's great in it. He's wonderful. And shut the fuck up. The scene with the the other um, officer when they're talking about the um, you know the the bad shit that went down on that one planet. I love that. I, I, I that actor. He was also he was in one scene of the Rob, the Rob Zombie Halloween films or whatever. But there's one scene in particular that he was in too that I was like, wow, this guy's so much expression in his face. Do you know the name of that actor? The guy with is the big the, grin? Like the, he's so, he's so good. I, I mean, like. I don't know his name offhand, but I know. I love that talking. episode though. Brown eyes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it was so just great, you know, and I hope it continues. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, the Mandalorian's over. It's fat. And I'm like, ah, what if, um, here's a question for you. What if a producer hits you guys up and was like, look, we really want to do a follow-up to the Monster Squad. I know there's been talk of it over the years. What would you say if it became like a, you know, a, 
series on Netflix or something like that. <laughs> um, if it was, I don't, I think it would be more of a, like a reimagining of it. Um, I, I know that they were, they, they were going to do a, a remake. They yeah. were going to do it. But did the fans a, get pissed off and like say, no way, we're, you're not going to make this? It was funny because, you know, we heard about it and, and some like at a convention, like uh, we're, we're doing like a panel or something. And uh, somebody in the audience says, you know, would you ever, you know, basically the same question you asked, would you ever be a part of something or would, do you want it to happen? And then we always say, well, there is something in the works that's uh that, that it's going to be a remake and we don't know anything about it. And then uh, we say uh, it's um, Michael, Michael Bay is going to do it. And the whole audience goes, boo. Because <laughs> <laughs> he, he has the right, he had the rights to it. I think he might've gotten rid of them because they're not doing that project anymore. But um, I don't know, like, Sure. I mean, call me, you know, call me. But the thing is, like, I don't know if I don't, I, I, I wouldn't want to, I don't think I'd want to do it without Fred or Shane. Like, it has to be authentic. It has to be real. And, 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 it, and it should be a continuation of really that should. story. It should be a continuation of the story. The one that I pitched to Andre basically goes that the military shows up at the end and they just take the bodies. They take the bodies of the bride. They take the wolfman's remains, the creature remains. They're not there to help Eugene. They're there to cover the shit up. And then you guys basically spend not only the rest of your teenage life, but then your adult years trying to let go of this, you know, post-traumatic event where you're, you know, fighting the monsters. Your character, I envision, you know, probably moving to New York, being a photographer, staying inside his loft all hours of the day, smoking a lot of cigarettes. (laughs) Andre's character, you know, at like birthday parties with Phoebe, like, you know, just looking at each other, like trying to get through it and blow out the candles and open the gifts. But the whole time, you know, that you threw the fucking ambulance into the limbo. You know what I mean? Like just doing it, doing it from a way where it's not like, let's get back together and defeat the, you know what I mean? Like they do that all the time, like make it an interesting character piece. You know what I mean? Like, wow, I really like that. I, I, I like the, I like the aspect. I like the cover up aspect and how right? we've, how, how, how the squad is always like known, but has never been able to get their you know, like say it out loud. Um, people always ask me about Rudy, like what would he be doing now? And like their, their like little uh, ideas about, you know, oh, he's like, uh, you know, a drunk and a mechanic and he's, you know, he like lives in a small town. He's like the mechanic of the small town. I'm like, that's boring. I'm like, you know what he is? Like, you know, if, if we did, if they did do the scenario where like, you know, Sean became a, you know, he became like the chief of police and whatever. And, it, uh, he had to go round up the squad because, like, it's it's happening again, kind of thing, you know. And then you have you get the reveals of, of what what the characters are doing these days, you know. I always envision like him coming to like some gorgeous fucking suburban home, knocking on the door, and uh, Patrick's sister answers, <laughs> and uh, Lisa Fuller, and she's and he's like, "Hi, is Rudy home?" <laughs> and then like. And then she goes, check the bar down the street, whatever. And like, he goes to the bar and you're like, oh, here we go. He's like fucking wasted. Like at the end of the bar, he's like losing his mind. And it kind of pans down the bar. And at the end of the bar, it's just Rudy sitting there like in a fucking three piece suit with a computer and like an iced tea. And he's just working, you know, like <laughs> yeah. he, you know, he's totally like just changed the whole thing, his image and everything. And, cool. you know, he grew up, he grew up, he married the, the love of his life. They fought mm-hmm. monsters together and like, you know, and now he's got like three kids and, and like one of them is like, wears a leather, like the little girl wears like a leather jacket every day. <laughs> like she, she's kind of a badass. Yes, it's the thing, but sequels are so tough. You know what I mean? Like uh, there's a handful of good ones and there's, there's ones where they're just, it's very curious. Like why you continue the story? I mean, I mean, I guess with, Cobra Kai on Netflix I guess there's so much potential for revivals from the 80s and stuff like that but I mean like I don't know I, I watched well also one. they they kind of already have remade Monster Squad it's called Stranger Things <laughs> yeah and you know what I mean like <sighs> I mean I watched that thing and I'm like 
wait a minute. Like, yeah, it's very that I guy's mean, got a leather jacket and he's got the thing on his back and he's got the he's got the shades and his hair's all like spiked up. I'm like, that's ready. <laughs> What was that like it's when cool. you watched that for the first time? Like when you did, like, hey, like there's this new show uh, called Stranger Things with a Winona Ryder. Check it out. And then you see, like, I mean, they're pretty much paying homage hardcore to you guys. But I mean, like, I don't and know. Then every, then every article I read about it was like, it's like the Goonies. Yeah. And I'm like, what? Mm-hmm. I'm like, the Goonies didn't fight monsters. <laughs> the Goonies fought an old lady. <laughs> she was great. They were lady. running away from an old lady to get a jewel to save their town from becoming a golf course. Such a great The Monster Squad were fighting Dracula to save the world. Like we actually killed things. Like we we were killing things. I mean, that's Stranger Things. Like it's kids fighting monsters. The end, it's the Monster Squad. Yeah. And everyone comparing it to the Goonies and it's like, hey, you know, we're over here guys. They're actually, they're actually ripping off the monster's butt here. And it, it's like, it, it goes, and, and you know, that, that, that sort of segues into the documentary where it's like, where was the love? Where was the love? We didn't get the love when we were, when, when, it, when it first came out. And all these years later, it's, it's, it, it actually did become a squad. The fans became a squad. If you, I would go to conventions and I would see someone wearing a Stephen King rules shirt. And then I would see someone else come up to them and go, Stephen King does rule. <laughs> and that person, that person was like, no, you don't, you don't know what this is. You're not getting it. You're not in the squad. You know, it's not like, you know, you walk around and everyone's wearing like uh, uh, Friday the 13th or Freddy shirts and things like that. It's like, if you're wearing a squad shirt, and, and the other person doesn't know, then you're special. Because it's like, it is a club. It is a club. Um, you're in the goddamn club, you know? What was it like when you went to that Alamo gig and uh, watched the presentation with uh, all the fans? Was that 2008, right? When you guys went to the draft house? The first one? Yeah. Uh, that was 2006, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I got a I got an email from some random person I didn't know, Eric Vespi, who uh, worked for Ain't It Cool News, and his favorite movie is The Monster Squad, and he wanted to do a screening. He, he you know, he's in Austin, Texas. He wanted to do a screening, uh, and 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 Tim, who runs Alamo, said, "Sure, I don't care, but like, can you get a couple of the people from the film to come and?" And, and talk maybe it'll be a better screening <clears throat> and so he did he reached out to i hadn't seen andre for i hadn't seen anybody in years in years and now i'm i'm living in san francisco and i get this email i'm like what i'm like oh god like okay well free trip to austin put me up in a hotel and i get to talk to like five or six people that love this movie i, I haven't even thought about this movie in forever every once in a while i'd go to like rent a video when there were still video stores and I'd walk by it and I'd be like, <laughs> you know, I just laugh like that these people don't even know that I'm in here right now. This is crazy. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we went, I said, sure. Sounds fun. I'll do it. And I went, uh, it was a madhouse. I thought we were going to go talk to like three people in the audience. It was a madhouse. In fact, they had to add a screening and they both sold out immediately. And it was Easter weekend. And it was, it was total chaos, good chaos. It was crazy. And I just had no, when none of us had any clue that any of this was happening all these years, that it, that it, that it had snowballed into this uh, crazy, I hate using the word cult film, but you know, Sort of like a, uh, you know, it's a squad film. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a club film. It's like you're in the club. It, it really is. And it's, I mean, it's, it, it still looks great. I just watched it a couple of nights ago and it was just like, wow. I mean, like every single shot, you know, I mean, Andre was talking to me a lot about like, you know, the extended sequences, which uh, I mean, in the beginning where they don't get the job done at the end, like how there'd be that, like, you know, um, 
bring it back when you like you know uh, stab the brides and stuff like that. But the film itself, oh, I mean, the throwback like, stuff, yeah, yeah the throwback, yeah. Sure. Like, it's a short runtime, but it's so solid. You know what I mean? Like it's like boom, boom, boom. Here we go. You know what I mean? And it dude, is a short film. It's actually so, short. It's only is, like is it true minutes. that Liam Nielsen is the the dude at the house? Like he was there on set, but the, he never made it into the film. Like when you guys arrive, well, the other characters because your character's gone. But were you on set to see Liam Nielsen? Um, I don't remember that. I know that it's true. Is that true? It's so crazy. It is. It is that. Yeah. No. It's definitely true. He was it's cast. So he awesome. was in it. He was in it. Um, I might not have been there on set that day. They. I, I'm sure. I think he was there for most of the day, and then they didn't use him. Or maybe they. Sh no, I don't think they even shot that stuff. But yeah, it's true. Liam Liam Neeson was in the Monster Squad. <laughs> it's so great, really. I mean, it's like such a. You know, what I mean? it's like finding out, like, uh, you know. I guess we also went off on a tangent with John Claude Van Damme and the Predator and stuff like that. But I love looking up stuff like that in movies, like the could have, would have, should have. You know what I mean? And like, sure, trying to figure out like what the movie would have looked like if this guy did it, or you know what I mean? Like, right? It's something to be said about the way that you know Decker and Black did it. It's 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 just resonates. I mean, the performances too by the monsters. I've always been fascinated too with like reading into it. Like, well, how did they do this if it's not Universal Studios monsters? Like. And that reveal, like, you know, I forget, maybe like 11 years ago when I was on like a internet binge, you know, like how like there's like these like subtle little differences that like allow you to use these, you know, non copy written characters. Like you could write a story about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde today and it'd be okay. You know what I mean? Like it's sure. so crazy. Sure. Um, but the story well, itself though, I mean, there's so many great moments. I mean, like obviously you're the little, you're a little bit older on set there were you frightened of like Tom Noonan or, you know, Duncan's like character? Cause I heard that they, you know, stayed in, in their character the whole time. They did. Uh, I wasn't scared of them. Uh, which is funny because like I've had, I've always had this like uh, weird fascination slash fear of uh, rubber masks where it doesn't even have to be a monster. It could be anything like Richard Nixon, or I'll be like, whoa, I, I don't, you know, why are you hiding your face? Like, I didn't like that when I was a kid. And I was, I, I, I always was a little afraid of like monsters and things like that and um, horror films. I loved them, but like, I was terrified. Like, I, I liked terrifying myself, let's say that. <laughs> um, when we were on set and like Dracula was walking by to uh to do a scene and my mom turned to me once and said can you believe you're doing this like because she knew and i'm like yeah i know i don't feel like uh i don't feel that fear because i'm working you know mm -hmm. there's something about it it's like i don't really like uh I, i've got like major vertigo like height problems and like you know, I, I, I don't really like being up high. Um, but if I had to do it for a film, it would like turn off. It's yeah, kind of a weird it's, thing. It's very interesting how that happens. Um, I, I, I felt the same way, like, you know, when I was a musician for a long period of time, like, you know, playing concerts and stuff like that, you know, like my wife used to say to me, like, don't, don't you get nervous? And just like, no, I, I, I don't get ner nervous doing it. It's not, it's like the switch just turns on and then like you're in that zone of like, this is what I'm doing because I'm a yeah. performer, you know, like, and there's something to be said about it. I mean, obviously with the pandemic, it sucks. You know what I mean? Like I thought like, you know, I maybe have, should have given music up or whatever. I reached this point of like, you know, three, you know, projects, maybe six projects, you know, where I've kept trying to push up against the wall of the, the juggernaut music industry of, you know, streaming and stuff like that. I had one band that, I got super close and I'm probably going to write a, a script about it one day, but it's like, I can't not stop chasing music. You know what I mean? It's like one thing the pandemic taught me is just like, never say that you're done anything. You know what I mean? Never quit. Cause it's like, <laughs> once you put it in paper, it's like, that's it. You know what I mean? You write it down, you're done. Right. Do you well, still when I do. And, uh, I, uh, I would, uh, I would be like, backstage or like in like a back area of a club you know before we would go on and you know having a cocktail smoking cigarettes chatting with friends you know 
that, that came to the show, you know, the cool friends that came, mm-hmm. not those jerks that didn't come. <laughs> the jerks that hit you up like, yo, man, can you put me on the guest list? Yeah, can I get on the guest list? Like, I got two spots. Is it like, cool? My, girl, my girlfriend's <laughs> one of them. <laughs> like, sorry. <laughs> yeah. What is that shit? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and then, and then like the sound guy would come over and be like, oh, hey, man, like, you're on in 10. I'd be like, great, thanks. And then they go, oh, my God, oh, my God, you're going yeah. on. There's like 500 people out there. Are you nervous? And I'd say, what? They go, are you nervous? I'm like, I've been doing this since I was eight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I feel the same way. Like, I, I, just, I just go out there. It's like, you know, it's like it goes back to my musical comedy days. It's like, you know, I'm standing on the side of the stage and they go, and one, and two, and three, and I'm a Yankee Doodle Dead. I come out and there's like hundreds of people out there. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not afraid. Like, I, I only do it because I love it. I know, right? And there's, a, there's this other thing that I always, that I always go by now. Um, I think it was Judy Dench that said, uh, they asked her sort of a similar question. And she said, fear is the batteries. It's the thing that makes you go out there. And if you don't have that feeling in you, if you don't have the batteries, you're not, you're not going to succeed. Like you need to, you, you kind of need to have that. It's not a fear when you get out there. I'm not afraid to go out there, but it's that like kind of nervous energy where you're like. I love that. I love living in that world of that nervous energy. If there's a name for it, it's like this mixture of serotonin, dopamine, all these different things going on inside your right. brain where you're in between the realities of like, this is my real life and this is the the role, the person uh, that I'm uh, uh, like going to to be. And I really think that it's interesting to me that, you know, um, you were into music before, you know, you started your acting career because I really think that the two really go hand in hand together. I mean, like I've seen so many bands, man, where like, you know, I'm like super stoked. I love their music. I tune in maybe on YouTube to check them out live. And I'm just like, what's going on here? You know what I mean? Like, are you guys going to move around? Is there is there any semblance of a performance here? Or are you just holding right. the microphone? And right. it always blows me away that sometimes like, they just don't get it you know what i mean but some some bands do get successful and they don't know how to put on a good live show you know but they right. know how to go cut an amazing album i miss all that i miss um i miss going to concerts i also like one of my all-time favorite things is going to a concert and watching a band that i love make a mistake because mistakes to me are just you know everybody makes them and it's like it shows oh god human i have a i have a great i love when i I love in the eighties. I loved every Halloween. I would go see uh, Boingo Boingo play oh, at wow, the Universal yeah, Amphitheater. Yeah. Every year they played the Universal Amphitheater Halloween show, and we would go. And one of the best things I've ever seen in a live performance is, uh, you know, Boingo Boingo was like a sixteen-piece band, you know. Yeah all commanded and like orchestrated by Danny Elfman. And he he would hear like the smallest screw up from one of the band members at a live show. He goes, stop, stop, <laughs> stop. And the whole audience would go, yes! They would scream because if you were a real fan, you knew what that meant. And what that meant was, he was gonna make everybody in the band in unison, in harmony, yodel. And it was kind of a special treat to get that. Like, oh, I went to Boingo's show and they did the yodel thing. Mm -hmm. And that was like their punishment. All right, you know what this means. And they all go, oh, yodel, 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 yodel. (laughs) I'll go into this thing. And it was like, what a great like thing to give to an audience. You know I, what I mean? Firmly agree. Like, what a wonderful like tradition to give to them, and and, and the other thing was, you know, obviously, ugh, you know what's really crazy. One year ago, today, it's funny we're talking today. One year ago, two today, I I saw I went to see Kiss at the Staples Center. Wow. One year ago today, I was in the Magic Kingdom with my son going on the Haunted Mansion. Oh wow! Thank, thank to my wife. 
the whole time, like the week leading up to it, I'm like, I'm a little concerned about this virus that's coming out of China. And she's like, where'd you hear that? I was like, I heard it on the Joe Rogan podcast. She's like, you're fucking full of shit. Nothing's going to happen. <laughs> Let's go to Disney World. And I'm like, I'm telling you, Joe Rogan knows these things. And uh, Wasn't it, you know, isn't it called Haunted Manor there? What's that? Isn't it called Haunted Manor? In no, it's the Haunted Mansion, I believe. I, my, in my, Florida? My, I, the I one in California, I believe, has a different name because it's a different, or there's one in Europe, but I mean. Here it's called ha the Haunted Mansion. Um, maybe it's the manor, but regardless, I've been going on. I've been, I mean, I've been going to Disneyland since I was a little kid. I've got a giant poster on my wall, like a map of Disneyland from the eighties. Oh, it's amazing! <laughs> I, I I love the um, what was the name of that doc on Disney? The Imagineering uh story. Um, oh, that was so good! God, it was I like it was like that. watching like I was I just like they so got all this. I knew they had the footage because I remember like on Sunday night sometimes as a kid. They would show like a little bit of the classic Disney World, like you know, vintage footage, which would lead into Eisenhower or whatever. Right. Like, but like all those like designs and like, in talking you know full scale here too, like you know, living in a world of imagination. I mean, like it's the best thing to like work for your imagination. I tell my kid that all the time. It's like, look, no matter what, just he's like he's an artist and like he gets very uh, upset like if he doesn't draw it correctly. I'm like, look, just do it and just move on, buddy. It's the best thing you can right. do. Don't sit there too long with it because that's when you suffer. That's when you become a crazy ass artist who doesn't know like which way is up and you're, you know, talking like out of your ass really, I guess on social media, you know, but I I, I love uh, watching bands make mistakes. Like I said, I've made mistakes on stage and I remember them more than like the best gigs. And, oh, yeah. you know, I, I started one gig one time, you know, I was a bass player in this one one band. I, I think I was in Drop D, like the first song, and I'm the I'm the intro lead. You know, had to stop, beat myself up tremendously for days afterwards. Like, like you, <laughs> you should have had to fuck. You know what I mean? And like, I really think that like you know that's part of the human experience. Like suffering, like you know, it makes you feel better in the long run because you're like, well, I'll, I'll get to do it again. You know what I mean? Like I'll have a second shot at it. You know, like sure. So, you know, I, I, I kind of took this time during the pandemic to um, kind of like get, get away from the bass and take over the instrument, which I've always had a problem with, with all the bands I've been in, and that's the drums. So like the drums, I've always had issues. I know you're a guitar player. Um, yeah. Also, I mean, like, isn't it wild to be at, like, in a band what it's like? Because, you know, being in a film is one thing, but being in a band is, is a really different thing. Can I, you know what I mean? I like it's such a the, different dynamic. The things that people, that, the one thing people don't really understand, uh, especially like Monster Squad fans, is like that was a very short period of my life. Tiny window. Like, yeah. I was uh, I was thirteen when I started. I was nineteen when I quit, and I quit for rock and roll. It's it's cheesy as that sounds. Like I was like, okay, I'm done with this. Like. I, I've always wanted to be like in a band and I want to be taken seriously. And the only way to do that is to quit this thing. And I mean, now you can be like these days, like you could do whatever, you know, but felt like back then there was, there really wasn't many people that could like cross over from acting into being a serious musician. You I wanted to be, I wanted to be REM, you know, I wanted to be you yeah. too. I wanted to be, you know, the Beatles, you know, I, I, I wanted it all. And, uh, and I did, I, I, I just went for it. And so from the time I was 19 till now, I'm going to be 50 in like three weeks. Um, I'm a musician, you know, like I've been in bands this whole time. I've been playing music in LA, in San Francisco, touring, you know, all over America. Make, I've, I probably have maybe 15 records under my belt. Yeah, I was listening to some of this stuff today, man. I like your tone. Um, I guess that's like my next question because because I'm a big tone guy. Like your guitar sound, do you base it yeah. upon like, uh, you know, like you were just mentioning, like I'm a huge REM fan too as well. I was devastated when they broke up. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I was just listening to Monster the other day because that, that oh album my God. came out like, at a really terrible so part of my life where it was like, I was a huge Nirvana fan, kills himself. I find out that Stipe and him are going to do something. I hear there's a song on this album because you read it in like the little Rolling Stone, little, you know, things back in the day and there was no internet and like this album like god i love the guitar sound on there i yeah. kind of hear that in your tone as well 
It's funny because uh, I was in LA once. Uh, I was in this bookstore and I saw Peter Buck. Oh, and I said, which, which, I, bookstore? I, which bookstore in LA? It was, it's a little one called the Daily Planet. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, he was in there and uh, I said, I don't normally do this. Like, I don't, you know, I just like maybe gawk from, a, from afar. But like, I'm like, I'm just gonna go say hi. And I just said, hey, Peter, like giant fan, just wanted to say hi, shake your hand so I could say I did it. And he goes, oh, okay, what was your favorite record? And I'm like, um, maybe Murmur? And he was like, oh God, okay, so on the third song, and he, he like gave himself the time to talk to me. And I was, you know, like, what pedals were you using on that? I'm like, oh my God, I'm like geeking out with Peter Buck right now. Like, this is amazing. Um, I always thought of myself as yeah, I, a person that used their guitar to write. Yeah. I, I'm not necessarily like a gearhead and I, I don't know how to solo. I, I play left-handed and no one would ever teach me when I was a kid. So it was all like on me. And basically what I did was just teach myself enough chords to write songs. So like, I feel like my real instrument is my voice. And uh, I use other things to make that happen. Um, I've always surrounded myself with like the best bass players, the best guitar players, wherever I am. like virtuosos that are like, but not too virtuoso, not like being Bay Malmsteen or, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, I know exactly just, that type of musician that you're talking about there, the one that- No, I'm an, I'm, an indie, I'm an indie guy, you know, like I've always been indie rock. It's just like teach yourself kind of guys. So right. like, yeah, I, mean, I always feel like if you, all these people that I see on like YouTube or whatever, or TikTok even like, that are just playing other people's stuff and they're great at it. It looks amazing. It's like, you're wasting, what, do you not know how to write a song? I, I, you know what, I've had so many offers to be in cover bands and I've had that same aesthetic oh, my entire life just being like, well, there's this band called The Bachelor Boys and you just basically learn 40 songs, show up to the gig and play and you get 300 bucks. And I'm just like, I would rather shoot myself in the foot than do, like, I just, there's something about it. I love music. I listen to, you know, music in my car all the time. I still, buy actual CDs where I can find them, you know, like it's, it sucks really with like what's going on with music. Cause it's like, I just got Spotify because my wife was like, just take the account, Bob, take it. I'm like, okay. And then like, I find myself like going through Spotify, listening to all these old things and then just like feeling guilty about it because like my record CDs and my tapes are like in the studio room over here. Like, I'm so happy though, that I grew up in that time period where my media, like, I had to earn it, you know what I mean? Like I had to be there at the right time to hit play and record to get, you know, what what's the frequency Kenneth like on a cassette tape so I could hear it before the album comes out, you know? Like those times really shaped my character. And I find that sometimes when I'm in traffic staring at somebody who's on their cell phone while operating, you know, a large piece of machinery, I'm like, <laughs> I miss those quiet moments of life where it was just me alone and like the, you know, the world was at my fingertips. The internet wasn't this like divide and like how you were saying, like with TikTok and Instagram, I see all these things like people who like sharing content, not, you know, like doing cover songs. Like why would you want to spend your whole life enjoying somebody else's expression? Which also, you know, like you said a few minutes ago too. And it's just like, it really like puts things into perspective for me too. Cause it's like, you know, I didn't know you before this podcast, but I only knew of you from this film that I watched probably every year since you made it, but it was a tiny little window of time for you. You know what I mean? Like, oh yeah, it was nothing. It was like a blip in my life. It's crazy. And it, it, it must, it, there must be something to be said about that. I wonder if that's ever actually been explored in film, really. Like, a, I guess Galaxy Quest comes to mind like a little bit. I, <laughs> 20 years ago with Tim Allen. I'd love that film. Um, just oh, someone, someone at the, at a convention said something to me about like, what if you guys like were just you at a convention, the guys from the monster squad, and then it really happened and you had to fight the monsters come. I'm like, they are ready made that movie. Yeah. It's called galaxy quest. <laughs> Gal um, just the whole idea though for the character like a, super the character meta being able to get away from it you know what i mean like imagine like 
I, one of the things that, you know, tying back Star Wars too, like I went on a deep dive not too long ago comparing photographs of his face and uh, the Return of the Jedi just because, you know what I mean? Like it, him, him getting into that accident. Like I never really looked into the details of like what happened to Mark Hamill when, you know. Oh yeah, he got in a car accident. Yeah, yeah, and like comparing the like the pictures together, you know, like, you know, I got time on my hands, you know what I mean? Like Star Wars. <laughs> you know, and like, I was just like, wow, like what was that like for him? Like, I would like to see a film about what it was like for him to be the world. Like you make this film, you think, oh, nobody's gonna see Star Wars. Then you make make it, you go on this like, you know, trip up the, the one there in California and you just fucking crash and like fuck up your face. Like that's the story I want to see, man. And then you, yeah. then you get, they're your biggest star in the world. You know what I mean? Like, I guess Vanilla Sky kind of touched on that, but like, oh, I don't know. Yeah. I've been into, yeah, you know, watching know. older stuff lately. And it's like, uh, I just saw The Fly for the first time, the remake with Goldblum. And I think the reason I liked it was because it was body Wait, hard. Hold on, was, stop. You just saw the fly. Yeah, yeah, because just. it's like I I don't know why. It's like <laughs> I, I you know like I listen to a lot of people like saying like, well, I didn't achieve anything during this pandemic. I'm like, no, I achieved a lot, man. Like I'm going through all these, like, you know, I have this list. What oh, I yeah. like about that film so much, and now I've seen it like a couple times just because I'm like I'm a I'm a screenplay writer and like I, I just enjoy like you know film and the nature of like you know writing like the body heart in that film isn't gruesome where it's like, oh, a human centipede. It's like, you care about him. You know what I mean? And like, right. you care about, you know, like his character. And it's like, I find a lot of times with the newer films, like they just don't get that part. You know what I mean? Like you got to care about someone first before you, you know, like take them through the hero's journey. You know what I'm saying? You always like, have to remember the essence of a, of a story has to be human. But Everything be else is just like kind of uh you know, window dressing or icing on the cake, you know, but you have to like get to the heart of what, of a, of what a character, who, he, who that person is. You, you can't just throw someone up on a screen. Like, you know, you were talking about like Cobra Kai the other day. It's like, sure. Like it's a kind of a cheesy re, you know, sort of a continuation of a story from the eighties. But like, do you remember that film? Like we, kind of cared kind of cared and that's why i dropped kid. out to be honest with and you. now was, like now we care about a different character that we didn't care about before thank like, you give yeah. me a break like that's how you do it yeah i just you know i watched season one just because you know the, the nostalgia you know hit and then season two i think i watched like two episodes i was like i, I just i can't do it no more it's like <laughs> I, I, I i and it was like i love those movies you know what i mean so it's like there's a fine line too and like that's why you know, like you said before, you would have to have, you know, the original team involved for the squad because it's like, you don't want to put something out there that's mediocre, you know what I mean? Which means so much to so many people. And like, I think sometimes too, that, you know- in this You can't case, just do it just to do it. You can't just do yeah. it just to do it. It's best also, to like, untouch there's, that. there's thousands of people in this world that would say, what is this? Yes. And you know what I mean, it has, so it has to be made for the fans. Because you can't just make a new thing and hope that like new people like it. You know, it has to be something that like the the real fans, the squad, the, the club knows and understands and it is for them. Little nods, little winks to the original thing. And, and not just like a new thing that people are like, oh wait, this was like a movie in the eighties that I never heard of. Yeah, I and don't now want they're that. remaking you know I mean? it. It's not gonna. It's not gonna work. It's I think that uh, that whole gimmick too of it being like, well, you know, they're a little bit older now, so the kids are taking over the major roles. Here are the new Ghostbusters that right, live in the farm. Right. It's like, and that's what it. What? And that's like, that's what I fear it would probably be. It would that, be like our. Hard. It would be our kid. It would be like Rudy's kids, no, Sean's Rudy's kids. kids. Nobody wants to see that. You know what I mean? Or kids. You know, like it. It would be. It wouldn't work. It wouldn't work and it would be the same old like that that it's so funny to me that like in the world of you know imagination these films get made that basically use the same plot lines over and over again you know what i mean like i guess when did it become a thing for the uh, the old generation to welcome in the new one there was a period of time in hollywood they're like well we're just gonna retrofit it all let's right. bring back the a team but that's not the a team you know what i mean like i did i have to say though during the pandemic i um I purchased uh, Bill and Ted Face the Music 
And uh, that was a film that was made for fans of the original. And, you know, I, it was cute. You know what I mean? I, I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. I cried, you know? It I, was for me. Yeah, I did too at the end. I was like, oh God, it's them. Like, dude, I, I didn't cry at the yeah. end. Before I cried and like you, like this, there's this one part where like Keanu Reeves just fucking nails the line. It's like, they're in their garage and they're like about to like, you know, here we go again. We got to write the best song in the world. And then like, you know, like he, like, Ted says to him, like, I'm tired, dude. And it was just like, oh, dude, I know that feeling so well. You know what I mean? Yeah. Being like, like, wait, we have to save the world. I'm exhausted. Yeah, I'm exhausted, (laughs) dude. Like, I can't do this shit no more. You know, like, I would, before the pandemic, I I joined up with this one band and I went on the road. We went on a a tour down south and I was a little bit older than them. And, uh, you know, like, I was just trying not to be the older, like, you know, disgruntled guy. And, you know, it was just like I, the whole time I just couldn't wait to get back home. But now, like, looking at it, I'm just like, man, I, I wish, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed it a little bit more because I missed that experience of, like, you know, being in front of people, you know, like, performing. It's just such a weird thing that it's like, I mean, here in Philadelphia, I guess you can go to certain places and do it. And, you know, it, it's just, it's a weird world that we live in now. You know what I mean? Like, I haven't... Uh... Because I left San Francisco in 2015 and moved here I, and have not started a band here, um, I have not played a live show in like seven years. Yeah, I feel and that. It's yeah. so sad to me. Like, I, I, But I don't want to use the cliche of like, it's like riding a bicycle, but like, I know that like I could just walk onto that stage and be like so happy and so ready to roll like let's just do that we have a so my band in san francisco actually made a record be, like way which before band, which band did we talk I, about like right? when, when i was still there which band uh kill moi mm-hmm. and uh we recorded so much stuff and right before COVID happened, my guitar player in that band, who also was uh, sort of the producer, um, said, why don't you come up and finish these like three, three tracks? So it's done. Like all we need on these three tracks is your vocals and we need a few other horn parts (laughs) because we have a four, four piece horn section in this band. (laughs) Um, And I did it. I finished it and we mixed it. It's done. It needs to be mastered, but we're going to put it out. Great. So I have a record ready to roll. It's coming out. And we're not sure exactly when, but um, at least I, I have that. And, and I feel like when, the, when, we, when all is uh, wrapped up with this garbage we're going through, um, I might put us together and do some rehearsals and, and do some gigs. And man, I can't wait to do that. I know, same. I was, I was going to reunite with a, a band that I toured with for like 10 years on, in May of last year. And like, it took me like five years. So like from 2015 on, I was trying to get these guys together. I'm like, come on, man, like everybody likes our shit. It's online. We should do this. You know what I mean? Like the albums still get, they get more and more popular over the years. And they were like, finally left for, you know, so many years of, you know, dismay. Like, all right, Bob, let's do it. And then COVID hits. And then I get the text from the lead singer right away. <laughs> like, you know, March 13th, the day of lockdown, like, will this mess up our gig, Bobby? And I was like, it already has, dude. It's, it's, you know, yeah, but I, that's, that's over. It's like, I always talk about on my show. I really hope that when music returns, people appreciate it more. And like, you know what I mean? Like the art of like going to see a concert, <laughs> not living it through your cell phone. You know what I mean? Like, it's just crazy how technology has really screwed things up. I say that now as I'm Zooming with, you know, <laughs> Ryan Lambert who played Rudy and the Monster Squad, which is just, you know, it, it's almost like sacri- sacrilegious to, uh, <laughs> you know, talk shit on technology, but- uh, Oh, I truly believe that it's gonna be an onslaught of, of social gathering events, like, I mean, I, I'm already like wait. I can't wait for the, like the COVID's over, like Live Aid type worldwide concert. Oh, like God, millions of people are like gathered together. 
Are they going to like Phil Collins is like resurrect like... Freddie Mercury for that one? <laughs> yeah, exactly. bring Freddie back, man. I think that that's, <laughs> I mean, like I, I was so influenced by that, you know, like, what is that? Like a 24 minute set that he does, you know what I mean? And like, yeah, just ripping it, you know what I mean? And like not giving a shit, you know what I mean? And like just the whole, like, I never, as a kid, I remember hearing the opening lines to um, Radio Gaga and just being like, what is that? Oh God, one of the what best is songs. That sound, you know, like, why does it sound so unique? Um, look, I could continue to talk with you for hours, man, but the sad nature of it is I have a responsibility. I gotta go pick up my son from his school. Uh, oh, okay. It's really just been a pleasure to get to know you. We have lots of things in common that I, I didn't anticipate. Um, I'm, smelling a, I'm smelling a part two. I'm smelling a part two. I will totally bring you back on the show. It would be <laughs> a pleasure. I also would like to, you know, uh, learn more about what's going on with the, this band that you've been recording with, you know. Um, I, dude, I think you and I are starting a band, right? I'm totally into starting a band with you. I, you know, I'm going to leave my family tonight. I'm going to say to them at dinner, like, look, <laughs> packing up the drums, okay, and the Mazda. And I'm going to go join Rudy because I'm in so the- your drums. All you're, right. You're strictly you're drums Don't now. say anything. Teresa, Tyler, I love you, but- <laughs> I gotta go. You know what I mean? Hey, it's gonna bring take- them along. Bring them along. Well, we're old enough now. Let's make it a family affair. My okay. son is like in one of the was in one of the biggest punk bands in LA. Like, let's just all start a band. Which one? Uh, he was in a band uh, called uh, No. Uh, ironically, No Parents. Oh, that's fucking great, dude. You know when I uh, when I lived in LA, and you know I was trying to wrap this up, but fuck it. <laughs> when I lived in LA, I worked at the Starbucks in uh, in Glendale, right by like you know uh, Silver Lake Boulevard. You know, would come up. I think it's probably yep. still there. And you know, um, at this place, I by met. By the way, I lived right there, right there. Oh wow, wow, that's crazy because I I met so many. <laughs> it's it's crazy that I didn't come across you, but I did meet um, uh, Butch Vig, and he I had a yeah. similar conversation with him, like you did with with a uh, Buck. Like he told yeah. me all about Nevermind and the recording process and sat there oh, with me. Oh, and then I refilled his drink for him. And I'm like 22 years old when this is happening, you know, thinking like, it can't get no better than this. And yeah. then a week later, Pat Smear from the Germs. And then, you know, at the time, you know, oh, he was the guitar player. He's standing there with his girlfriend. And like, I was just like, wow, like, what an honor. You know I mean? Here's a green tea fucking Frappuccino. Nice to meet you. But <laughs> The other thing I remember from there is there was this kid that I worked with and this kid, man, he was, he was like a total Angelino and he was in a punk rock band. And he said to me, he's like, he's like, yeah, man, I like the fucking rock, you know? And I'm like, cool, man. What's the name of your band? He's like, I fight me. And I was like, dude, that's one of the best fucking band names I ever heard. And I still think <laughs> of it like from time to time, like 21 you know, years later or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, man, I wonder if he ever made it, but there's something to be said about the LA punk rock scene it's so cool um i've always enjoyed uh, you know talking about music when i bring you back we will do just that yeah i'm in, i'm in man let's do a whole let's do a whole nother thing on it on it I'm, I'm in totally down thanks so much for your time i appreciate it uh, enjoy the rest of your day out there you too brother all right everybody my name's bob i'm a happy man at age 41 you know the childhood version of myself tonight will sleep really well my name's Bob, and this has been another episode of Bobcast.